All right, guys. How's everybody doing today? Uh, welcome back for, I think it's the seventh, eighth, I don't know. Who who counts anymore? It's Corona. It's Nobody cares anymore. Um, but welcome back for another episode of uh, Movies, Music, and Mayhem. This week, I have a very, very special guest. Um, everybody in the chat knows him. I mean, come on, guys. It's it's Mark, baby, carrots, Ellis, or is it Colonel Mustard now? Oh, what no, is that boy up died. to? That was me. <laughs> that, was, that was me being the one that got killed. So don't worry, oh. I'll come back into focus in oh. just a sec. There we go. Well, it is awesome to have you on. I'm so excited. But we have a very surprise guest on that wants to come on and say hi. Ah. It's <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> it is so great to see you. My my favorite member of the family is now joined the yeah. show and. I had such a blast performing for you and your friend, uh, Donna. Yes. Yes. Oh my God. The first time it's ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> I heard he called her Debbie a lot. Deirdre. I was going Debbie. I was yeah. going Deirdre for a while. Oh. And then I finally remembered it was Donna's in the song, Oh Donna. And so Donna was kind of your wingmate coming to my show. And you guys brought us the biggest plate of brownies I've ever seen, the most delicious plate of brownies. And those brownies <laughs> were actually eaten for dinner by me, Ken, and Josh. So yeah. it was it was a perfect evening of stand-up. Good. Well, it was a nice night. You did great. Oh, was too, I told so many people about that show. I said, too bad you can't go to it. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it'll, be, it'll be back soon. I am, yeah. I am itching to, I'm really itching to get anywhere. I mean, I, I was telling someone online today, like if there's a comedy club on Mars that I can perform at, I'll go. <laughs> like, I just, I need to get back on stage. Yeah. Sure San Francisco is definitely on my list to get back to soon. Cool. All right. There is a way to support him, however. You can send everybody over to Amazon Prime where they can check out Dog Stepfather, um, which is Mark Ellis' uh, one-hour special that we filmed in Chicago over Celebration Weekend, uh, which was hilarious. If you if you listen real close for a very awkward laugh, that's me. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Rachel Rachel told me that night, she said that, uh, that she's going to both shows and she expects to be made laugh even at the late show, she needs to be made to laugh. And I'm like, well, you've already seen it, so I need you to laugh. I need I need you more than you need me at that point. <laughs> wow. And I did. To it. I delivered. Uh, yeah, cool. it's great. Um, but so uh, in honor of Mark, um, we do have our Coors Light here tonight. So we're just going to have a nice little, everybody, oh, yeah. drinks. hold up your, hold up I gotta your. Go get my, uh, I got to go get my lager. Give All right, we'll, we'll wait for the toast. And in that time, <laughs> hi, Mama. Hi. Everybody loves you, says hi. Oh, hi, Lucas. You sweet one. <laughs> sweet, sweet man. Um, This will be a good episode. Everybody drink it. <laughs> oh, Peggy, we can't do that. Like, girl, no. <laughs> ER is already taxed. Yeah, really. Oh, Louis the Frenchman. Love you, babe. He has a great show that uh, Schmills in the North, guys, go check it out. Um, oh my gosh, everybody's here. Jenny and PC, my girls. Um, so yeah, so mom, how's everything in San Jose? Quiet. Very That's quiet. Lovely. I'm, I'm, I'm joining you tonight drinking almond tequila. She has been talking about this tequila for months. It's so good. Well, so. I am actually, I told Rachel yesterday that I did not need her. She kindly offered to deliver me some Coors Light so that I'd have some ready. And I was like, I'm kind of insulted that you would think I wouldn't have Coors Light in the fridge. <laughs> but I'm going different tonight. I'm going a little rogue in honor of your hippie mom who lives near the Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco. I am drinking a pot soda here tonight. This oh is my goodness. Soda. My Lagunitas Hi-Fi ah. Hop to get some THC and some CBD <laughs> in there. And cheers to you, beautiful you ladies. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Have a good evening, guys. <laughs> All right, Mom. Love you. I will talk to you soon. I'm sure I'll have you on um, <laughs> at a later show, but I'll talk to you later. Love Bye. You. Bye. <laughs> oh, she's the best. She really is. She was like, I just want to come in and say hi. Because she was like, who's on your show next? I'm like, Ella. She's like, oh, how's he doing? <laughs> It's like he's good. She's like, I just want to say hi. She's okay. my favorite. I, I've seen we, we've gotten to spend time together at the the Schmodown studio a number of times, and then yes. uh, doing stand up occasionally. And so she's just all, she lights up a room. She I see where you get it from. Aw, thanks, Mark. Now what do you want from her? Because she's still listening. <laughs> Give me the brownies. Give me all the brownies. 
<laughs> just keep sucking up for the brownies. Um, okay, so um, just to give you an idea of what we do here, movies, music, and mayhem, we obviously talk movies, music, and the mayhem that goes along with our lives. So how have you been doing? <laughs> I've been doing great. Your mom was interviewing me um, earlier and she was asking me about my priority in life, which is obviously we golf. And I was thinking about it. It's like, I'm really good at that. And it's the only kind of golf I'm really great at. And so why would I ever play real golf again? Because yeah. real golf is expensive. You have to leave the house. You have to interact with other people. You might get hit by a real golf ball. You might embarrass yourself in front of other people. Here, I'm in my element. I'm by myself. It's just as competitive and I'm really good. And no bug bites. Absolutely none. Yeah. No dress code. It sounds amazing. <laughs> Actually, there is a dress code. If you're wearing sleeves, you're overdressed for the occasion. That's fair. That's fair. Unless you want to pretend it's like winter and then you crank the AC and throw on a hoodie. You're like, yeah. That's awesome. I do have central AC, so maybe I should play with the weather elements. <laughs> <laughs> maybe get a little cross breeze going. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Tempe, Arizona, where Mark's thermostat is tuned to 89 degrees. I mean, if you need a challenge, just saying, there's always that element to throw into it. But have you been what? Uh, have you been listening to new music or discovering movies that you've loved or new ones or? Um, let's see, movies. It's been more of like a left turn for me from an entertainment standpoint because I've gone more towards television than actually proper movie watching. So there are some movies that I saw for the first time during this whole thing. I caught Onward, which I really liked. Um, okay. Thought that was great. Um, I saw uh, Donnie Brasco and had never seen that before. Shocked. And that's that's pretty good. But now I'm watching uh, The Sopranos. I'm, I'm just going to go through all six seasons of that. So I'm about to finish season two and I've never seen it before. And I'm really, really engaged. I'm a, I'm a fan. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I, I feel like I lived the Sopranos with my dad's side of the family. Like I was going through some old pictures that I found and it's like literally these old men sitting around the kitchen table, like cutting olives and garlic and stuff. And I'm like, Oh, is this good for us? Or uh, Godfather or Sopranos, like it could have been a shot from any of those movies. I'm convinced that like all of those kind of Italian mafia, either TV shows or movies have some sort of connection with the food industry. It, because everybody who watches those just gets so hungry for that kind of food. Like I'm, I'm trying to be healthy and I just eat pretty much nothing but like chicken breast and sweet potatoes and broccoli right now. But when this is over and I can take myself to a nice Italian restaurant, I will go. I will tuck the napkin in like a bib because I'm going to need it because I'm just going to crush pasta and sauce and meatballs. And I might go in for second or thirds or fourths and just pretend like it's a never ending pasta bowl for me. Well, I mean, you could just come over here because I make sauce by the vat <laughs> and it's delicious, like legit, like a 10 gallon tub of it. It's well, amazing. you do have a little army to feed at your apartment. So is, I do. is your brood hanging in? OK, they're doing all right. Yeah, um, it's really sad, though, because Alex can't have the sauce because I'm Italian. So I put a crap ton of garlic into it and mm -hmm. uh, he's kind of allergic to it. So sadly, he doesn't get to partake. But uh, yeah, everybody's doing good. And, you know, everybody's using these types of methods to stay in touch and, you know, advance, you know, their careers in weird ways. And <laughs> We're all just treading water, it, you know, yeah. that's like, especially comedians, like that's all we can really do is just remind people, Hey, I do this thing that is illegal right now, but it won't be forever. So remember me when that thing is no longer illegal. And, and in the meantime, you can watch me perform back when it was legal on here we're here, we're here, and we're just we're just trying to stay afloat. That's all we can do. Well, I mean, how many people can you invite to a Zoom meeting? Because I feel like you could do private parties that way. You can, and I've actually had a couple offers to do stuff like that, and I've I've said no up to this point just because like it's just not it's not the same, and it just feels weird, and I I just don't want to. I mean, I there's a lot of my comedian friends that are doing actual like stand up shows in their apartment. Like they're doing full sets. And I just haven't had the itch to do that yet. I, I have the itch to get in front of people live, but that's about where I draw the line. I think I, I, think I performed for too many empty rooms when I was doing stand up starting out that I think I'm done with that phase of my life. That's, that's fair. I mean, and considering, you know, your, your uh, neighbors will probably think that you're just 
insane. Like you finally lost it and you're just like telling jokes loudly to absolutely no one and then pausing for the laugh. Well, the, the neighbors uh, above me moved out like a month ago. And so now they're starting to do some like uh, demolition and reconstruction on the upstairs apartment. So it's good and it's bad because it's very noisy during the day sometimes. But at night, I could probably just sneak up there and make that a comedy club. Like I could put a curtain up there and a little mic and a brick wall. I could do the whole thing upstairs. Well, it looks like Jill is volunteering her Zoom chats. She can have over 100 people in them. So, wow. I mean, we've actually been doing um, uh, Saturday night uh, every now and then we'll just like You'll, you'll check your phone and you've gotten a text from Jill or Sean and it's like just the Zoom code and the passcode and you hop in, there's like 20 people in there. And Did you do that to me one time? Out. Yeah, we sent you one one night. Yeah, I think I, I think I saw it the next morning. And I was like, what the hell is this? She's, it, like, I just assumed you sent me a link by accident. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> I, I, it's, it's not my night. I, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, we, uh, we, we were like, we should get Mark in here. And I was like, mm, I doubt he'll answer. But I'll send it to him anyway. No, I'm very uh, selective with my with my text responses. I, I really take my time and I craft a response. It's not immediate. I've 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 noticed, but it's <laughs> oh, hold on. I've been uh, notified that we are a little bit pixelated and apparently have paused. Uh, sorry, hold on one second. Gonna blame you what? for that. I I know probably. <laughs> hold on, let me let me come back out and I'll come back in real quick. I'll entertain the folks. If you guys are still watching, hey, finally, you and I get a chance to talk. This is why I have no desire to do stand -up. It's never a good sign of a stand-up show when the first thing you say when you're on stage is, hi, everybody, welcome to my show. Please mute your mics. That's never how you want to kick off a stand-up show. So I just haven't had the appetite to, oh, wait, 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 here she is, never mind. <laughs> I was just going to let you go and see how long you were going to run out until you run out of material or just yeah. like. I can still go. It's it, it may not be stand up, Mark, but I can still go. I mean, anything you know me, I'll laugh at just about. Well, I just everyone needs to laugh at this point in life. Yeah, well, uh, that, that does look like a delicious Coors Light you're uh, you're sipping on there. How's it treating you? It's good. And Justin is hey, saying hi, hey, buddy. The bathroom, buddy. <laughs> Always go to the bathroom in pairs if you're at a bar in Atlanta. Trust me. I mean, I find it funny that. Uh, I find it funny that uh, men are just now learning this, whereas women have learned, have known this, like, <laughs> since they've been born. Like, it's just kind of in our DNA. Like, we even when we, like, get our diapers changed, we're, like, holding hands and skipping to the changing table. Yeah, but, I mean, I said in pairs, Rachel, y'all go in droves. It's like you guys are having, like, a like a team huddle in there. Like, like you're coming up with the next play to escape all the loser guys you're with. That's exactly what we do. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. It's great. I knew it. Oh, of course. Yeah. What else are we going to go in there and do? Pee? No. No. We want to escape the loud music. We want to bitch about the stupid guys that are in the bar. See which one is actually spending because then they can buy us drinks because he's probably too drunk to remember. So. Well, yeah. His I know name is Jake awful, but... Yeah. That's who you want. <laughs> oh, but we love Jake. Yeah. Jake is the kindest drunk I've ever met in my life. Oh, my yeah. God. He's just the best man ever. I'll buy like a round of beers and think I'm like the hero. And then the next thing you know, there's like nine trays of shots coming out. And it's like, well, I guess I, Jake got me again. I mean, to be fair, the first trip in New York, you did knock everybody out. Like, yeah, I'm sneaky like that. I figured that that's the trade off in life that I have to make because I love Irish goodbyes. I, I'm great at it. So I figure, like, if I'm going to just disappear for the rest of the evening at some point, I should probably pay for everyone's tab. So <laughs> I just, I, and I'm just as sneaky with that too. Like, like, I don't like making a show of it. I'll just like pull over to the side, like, or, or the wait staff person or the bartender, just be like, "Hey, just go ahead and just go ahead and knock this thing out because I want to leave." <laughs> so I'll yeah, sign I, it and I'll get the hell out of there before anybody I've knows got, I hit him. I've gotten close to literally hopping over the bar when I have seen, like I've been at one end of the bar and you've been at the other and you, I, I know when you make that move mm -hmm. and the, all you see is like the bartender walking back towards the register with like a, all right, look on his face. And I'm like, no, 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 you do not let him pay for my tab. And he's like, it's already done. I'm like, mother effort. It's not even me being generous. It's just like, it makes their lives so much easier. If you're in the service industry and you have like 50 of us rolling up to your restaurant, you, you just go into a panic. And so it's just the, the consolidation of debt, if you will, just it makes it easier on everyone. Yeah, but considering the bar that we always tend to go to, 
Like they know us at this point. They know that every Saturday we're coming over and just destroying their entire patio. Oh, like they're prepped for it. They hired the, you know, the best waiters and waitresses to come out and, and handle us. And the bartenders all know us at this point. Like legitimately I walked in one day and they were like, oh, hey, hold on. And literally went over and made three other drinks grabbed one of them and brought it over to me without me saying a word. And I was like, that says so much about me. I might be worried. Um. Yeah. They kind of know our taste at this point. Like they know that I'm going to show up and I'll probably want like one or two light beers to start. And then I'll probably close the evening down with an IPA or two or five. And so that's how it tends to go for us. But like nothing feels better than a well-earned night out drinking. Because like, if we're doing this after a day of taping Schmodowns, then it's like, we just knocked out six or seven and I announced all, all of them. So like my voice is done. And the only thing that's gonna help me keep talking is a little bit of the liquid courage. So you just go right across the street and it's, it's so much fun. And that's the kind of stuff that I miss. Like, you know me, I, I don't really miss the day-to-day -day human interactions all that much. I'm pretty comfortable by myself, but I like those those bursts of a big interaction at once. And this is like the, the thing that we're exactly trying to avoid in this yeah. time in our world. So hopefully we can get back to that soon. I have been dreaming about our first shoot day back. I know it's going to be like 19 hours. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and like, we're probably going to have to like send like runners over to the bar to get drinks and then run them back across the street. Yeah, um, to I'm the looking studio. forward to the, the email from Christian that's like, hey, make sure you bring your tents and your sleeping bags because yeah. we're just gonna we're just going straight through the evening with this. Yeah, I'm gonna I, I mean, to be fair, our our apartment is like five minutes away. So we can just like hand our keys off to people and be like, great, take off your shoes when you get inside, go take a nap, take a shower, come on back, like and if I may say, I think y'all have one of the better apartments for guests crashing on the couch in. Yes. We really do. The couch is also amazingly comfortable. We have a massive amount of space in the living room. We have a blow up mattress. Um, I've got a queen size bed that Janine has slept in many a times uh, coming to visit uh, for her times down for tapings. It's just so much easier. She just comes down and stays. Um, and but Alex, yeah, we, look, Alex doesn't need a whole bed to himself. Alex can share. I mean, at this point, everybody kind of just wants to share just for that human interaction. Like, I think Brandon like touched my arm and I almost cried the other day realizing it had been like two months since I've had actual like physical touch, <laughs> which is hard. Cause I mean, you know me, I hug. I like my love language is, phys is physical touch. So it's like not being able to actually touch human beings. I'm like, I'm going insane. <laughs> I think that's the way we're going to do it from now on is like when there is a physical interaction, it's either a hug or it's nothing. It's like, it's all or nothing at this point. Like handshakes oh, yeah. are done. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to like deny somebody a handshake or a high five or a fist bump or even a hug, but I'm just not going to be initiating a lot of stuff. Yeah. And I will be. I'll, I'll, be I'll receive whatever the other person wants to initiate as long as it's within reason and it's consensual. Yes. <laughs> Although some people are not going to have a choice because I'm going to crush their ribs with hugs. Uh, <laughs> that's just how it's going to be. <laughs> so you said you watched Onward. Am I assuming that you've gotten Disney Plus then? I had Disney Plus for a while. I, I ended up nixing it finally just because like, I, I, I was paying for that in the Hulu bundle and even ESPN Plus. And like, I just have enough stuff that I can watch through other devices that I don't need that extra whatever in my life. So basically I can take all my Disney plus money and I can just spend it at the bar on, on everybody. <laughs> so it, <laughs> you can thank baby Yoda for, for your next free beer. And like, I, I just, I don't have a whole lot of interest. I like a lot of Disney stuff. I like the Pixar stuff, uh, the Marvel movies. If there isn't a new episode of the Mandalorian, then I really don't like, it's not just part of my scrolling. So yeah. I'll live. And then once Disney plus has the new season, of the Mandalorian next year, then I'll tune in for that. So well, I'm I mean, just gonna like, come and go as I please. Well, they do have the uh, they do have that uh, documentary that's coming out like uh, episodically for the making of the Mandalorian. I heard those are great. Yeah, they're already out, and like yeah. I, I heard that they're amazing. So I mean, usually what I would even do with Mandalorian, like I'm not opposed to going to Ken's house and just watching it from there because right. I know he has it. So I just come just, over and I can just log in. We. 
<laughs> we, uh, <laughs> we, 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 we had, we had a deal because him, Ken, me, and, uh, and Christian Rubalcaba, we all went to DC, uh, together to do shows. And so we're all staying at the same hotel and the new episode of Mandalorian had dropped. And so we, Christian and I were very, uh, cognizant that Ken has a specific way he wants to watch the Mandalorian. So yes. there, were, there was no talking during the show. And so basically we just watched it twice. So we watched it once with no talking and then we watched it again so that Ken could kind of give us little pointers as to what's going on. But it was, it was fun. It was, I think that might've been like one of the first, that might've been the, one of the first ones where baby, I think it was the second one. So like baby Yoda is like in the whole thing and you're like, yeah. Oh shit, there's this fucking it's Yoda. Yeah. Well, it's the child. I can't wait until the world is disappointed with whatever that thing's name is. It could be Frick. It could be Bob. It could be Jimbo. They're going to be pissed off. It's going to be like Clarence or something. <laughs> Marvin. <laughs> what if his name's Larry? It is <laughs> so good. Hey, this is Baby Yoda, and Baby Yoda's official name is Chad. So deal with <laughs> oh, it. Oh, God. Or Brad. <laughs> Just make it that. Just bro him out super hardcore. <laughs> but he only goes by B. It's it's the thing that Star Wars fans have to look forward to right now. You know, I don't know when we're getting a new movie, but okay. I would love to see one. I'd love to hear some concrete news about it. And I still have I haven't got a chance to see the uh, the new tenant trailer that dropped today, but I heard yeah. it was pretty cool. Yeah, I haven't seen it either, but I'm really looking forward to it. But uh talking about Star Wars. Happy Empire Day. Yep. This is the day, the 21st of May, 40 years ago, when we were all introduced to what many consider the greatest Star Wars film of all time. Not necessarily myself, although Empire Strikes Back, my family claims this. They claim that this that Empire was the first movie that I ever saw in theaters because technically I saw it in like 1982 or 1983 because I was a little baby and we lived on an Air Force base. And so I think that it was playing at the theater on the Air Force base. So they weren't getting like first run movies. And so my mom claims that that was the first one that I ever saw in a theater. So I usually chalk it up to either like Flight of the Navigator or King Kong Lives because I remember going to the theater to see those. But <laughs> I think it might have actually been Empire Strikes Back. So now I get to be one of the cool kids. Oh, Flight of the Navigator. It's so I good. How did, how did they not think when they were when when they first started coming out with those GPS like the Tom Toms remember like the ones you had to like stick to the 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 top of your uh, car ledge yeah like the Garmin Day, apparently but like how did they not think to use the Pee Wee Herman voice like how did like we all grew up with that as the navigator how do you not use that voice as your navigator as an adult it's very disappointing um, I miss. Paul Rubens, any day that I don't hear the Pee Wee laugh is a bad day in my book because like it, it, Pee Wee became bigger than life. But if you just go back and watch Pee Wee's Big Adventure, pound for pound, it's one of the funniest movies ever made. It is brilliant from start to finish. It's funny now, but it was terrifying for me as a child. Large Marge? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nightmares. Worst accident I ever seen. Yeah. No. Nope, 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 nope. Still, still gives me a little bit of like a mm -mm, get me out of this room. Uh <laughs> oh, it's so good. And Mickey the convict, and uh, I'm a rebel dotty, and and the the Mr. Herman paging Mr. Herman. It's just there's there's so much greatness in that. And it started, and every time it's anybody's birthday. The first thing I think of is Francis Buxton telling Pee Wee, today's my birthday, and my father said I could have anything I want. I mean, <sighs> I used to do that when I was a kid. I think my dad got really upset about it. Because <laughs> I was like, meh. Uh, Haskell comes in with a, Luke, I am your father. Chet. Yeah, that would be terrible. I'm up for it, man. Anything that, anything that, that lets us all talk about the thing we love on the internet more, right? <laughs> right. Well, speaking of, uh, so the internet's been a little, I, in my opinion, it's been a little calmed down as of late. Aside from like the whole Snyder cut thing, like it's been pretty chill. It was really, uh, I was really excited about it for a while. 
there might just be like a weird sine cosine kind of wave that everybody feels at the same time where you all feel like, oh, we got to run to Twitter and we all got to fight about shit. And then there's other days when it's just like, though it seems like the collective world is like, nah, we're all taking a break and we're just going to do something else, which is healthy, which is like, like, I, I think in a perfect world, Twitter would be legal for like one hour a day. Like you, your phone would literally lock you off Twitter once you pass the hour point, and then you can do no more tweeting until tomorrow. So get your best licks in, and then hands off. You can't, you can't even access the website after that. You get your opinion out, you share ideas with some people that are on there, and then you're done. Do something else with the rest of your day. So it's like a daily purge for an hour. <laughs> and that's exactly Just what the it sirens was. go off all over the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there's like there's days uh, and uh, like days in a row that I won't tweet anything. I won't even go on there. And then there's other days like today. I had a pretty good day on Twitter because I was just you know I I thought of a couple funny things and I threw it out there. And then um, like some stuff happened. People are still talking about the Snyder Cut and the new Nolan trailer. So there's some stuff to do, but I just I never get more than skin deep with it. Yeah. Now I know you talked about it ad, ad nauseum, uh, but. I'm excited for the Snyder Cut. I'll, I'm going to watch it. I know you're going to watch it. So awesome. Yay for Snyder. When yeah, I, I, gets his vision? I'm going to I'm going to watch it. Uh, good for him. Um, I think that it's going to be the same thing, though. It's not like this movie is going to come out and everybody's going to be like, yeah, see, we as a collective people all love this movie. It's going to be just as divisive. You're going to have people that like it, people that don't like it. You're going to have people that defend it so vigorously that the other people are going to be like, you're just saying that because you're a fanboy and you refuse to see any plot. And it's just like, who gives a shit? At the end of the day, I like yeah. Sucker Punch. So I have nothing yeah. to lose. I kind of do too. It's a, it's a cool, long, action-packed music video. That's it. It really is, with some really good music too. Some really bad music, but I don't want to bring that down. But actually, it's a beautiful segue. It's like you know that I need to segue onto music. Yeah, um, it's so perfect. Um, I'm, sending my, so I'm sending my brain waves from this to you. Yes. So everybody knows how big of a fan Mark is of Van Halen. Have you discovered any new bands recently um, since you've had a little more time to like dive into Pandora or Spotify or God, any of that? Damn it. Yes. Yes. And now I have to look up the name of this band because the, it's something with. Uh, uh it's something with honey can anybody help me out it's it the, the name is it dirty honey did i just stumble upon that i think it's dirty honey and they've been they've been played recently on 95.5 the rock station out here and it's awesome they have like the whole album just kicks ass it's great yep. stuff um, dirty honey, um rock. yep is a great tune that they play a lot out here and there's another band um that i can't remember the name of offhand that I actually heard them rocking out today too. That is, uh, it's a it's a female lead singer, and the song is um, I, like I want to die by rock and roll or something like that. Like that's how you want to get killed by rock and roll, and it's awesome. And I highly recommend it. I know I'm not giving everybody great um, <laughs> nuggets to search off of, but the what other else one. What do we have to do though? <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, we'll search it, no, guys. Go look it, it up and report back. It, it, it's like a murder that we're solved. So it's like, okay, there you go. I gave you clues. Now go off in the world and solve the riddle, so to speak. But there's a great Long Beach band called Rival Sons that I've been listening to a lot of as well. Yeah, Rival Sons is a great local band for here in LA. Uh, they've been around for a little bit of a while. Um, yeah. Really excited that they're finally getting like discovered and you know coming up in the world. Um, yeah, if you get a chance, I highly recommend, uh, what was it? Uh, so PDL, um, Paul Denuzio. Uh, had nominated me for one of those like 10 bands or 10 albums in 10 days. And I was like, no, no, I'm going to take my time. It's going to be 10 artists. <laughs> We've got plenty of time right now. I'm just going to stretch it out. So um, uh, I think that you would really dig, because I know you like that kind of like, uh, kind of like that laid back, really classic rock. I think you would really like Butch Walker. Um, he's okay. a guy, he was in, do you remember the band Marvelous 3? Uh, yes. They had, a, they had a song in the early 90s called Flavor of the Week. Okay. Um, he's the lead singer of that band. They broke up and then he went solo and he has been writing and producing uh, for everyone. Like he worked with Tommy Lee, who is actually the reason why I met Tommy Lee and got to hang out with him on one of my birthday parties. That's a good um, birthday. 
That was a very good birthday. I was two days after my 22nd birthday, went to go see Butch Walker at the hotel cafe and literally sat down <laughs> with my old roommate, Ryan Parkinson's, who just hopped in with a red balloon. I hate you so much. Wow. You. That's um, so cool. And that hotel cafe, that's a cool spot in Hollywood. To go. It's a cool, intimate setting to go see some music. Yeah, it was. But this was also before the expansion. So it was still super narrow and packed in. And um, that's what they I had went, the three yeah. tables that came out. And Tommy ended up, my friends ended up getting us seats like right at the front. And the four back seats uh, at the end of our table were reserved. And Tommy ended up sitting right next to me, found out we were there for my birthday and bought all my drinks for the rest of the night. And we like hung out and stayed in touch and like ended up going to his house for a closing night party for, you remember that? It was a terrible, terrible show. Uh, there were, it was Rockstar Supernova. Yes. Where it was yes. Tommy Lee and uh, Jason Newstead, and I can't remember who else mm -hmm. right now, but they were trying to find like the lead singer of this super band. Yeah. And we went back to his place for an after party and it was ridiculous. And yeah, was that the show that they did? It. So so they had a season of it where it, they, they found In Excess's new lead singer. Yes. And yeah. who wasn't bad. No. With that uh, uh, Pretty Vegas song or whatever. It, 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 it was, he it, it yeah. was a comparable replacement for. Yeah, great nice guy life. too. Yeah. But um, I remember reading about that show because that show they did, they ended up doing that super group because they were really going hard after Van Halen to be the next season of that show, which, which would have been huge. And I remember reading that and thinking like, is this is good and bad because <laughs> it, sometimes, it, you know, you just don't want to turn on the light if you know you're going to see a bunch of cockroaches. So I, at that <laughs> point in the band's career, I don't think that they were ready and capable of doing something like that. Now I think they would be, but um, you know, it, it back then it was like, well, let's just let sleeping dogs lie for now. And then maybe they'll get back together with either Roth or Hagar. They end up getting back with Roth and having a lot of success. So all is well that ends well. Well, had they gone on for that season afterwards, I would have been hanging out with them every week for, because of, I made friends with the PA uh, that was on site. Uh, he actually, the PA ended up being a friend of a friend of course, because it's LA and I was also 20 and had like no friends and nothing to do during the day because I worked at a movie theater. Um, so we were there for like every taping and then, uh, yeah, so I would have been able to hang out with them. That would have been, that fun. been epic. The closest I ever got was um, my friend who's a comic, Don Barris, he does the crowd warm up at the Jimmy Kimmel show. And so... I've, I've been to Kimmel a couple times and it's a really cool, like kind of underground, like all the green rooms are in the basement kind of of the mm -hmm. El Capitan theater. And it's a really nice, like spread down there. There's this big common area with the pool table and stuff. And everybody in Van Halen had different dressing rooms and like Dave and Eddie were on the opposite side of everything. So, um, and it was like a surreal moment because I'm kind of cued there with my friend who's also a huge Van Halen fan. And we're just kind of waiting to go up. But before we walk up the stairs to go outside because they were playing on Hollywood Boulevard, like they shut down right. Hollywood Boulevard from La Brea to, to uh, Highland. Like it's a big movie premiere and they had the stage right there. And so uh, we are about to go up the stairs. But before we go up the stairs, you look over and it's just like Van Halen is just walking up the <laughs> stairs. And it's just like, and it was it was so cool because like it, it was like that scene in Die Hard Two and all the terrorists are leaving their hotel rooms at the exact same time and they just fall into line. So they all leave their dressing rooms at the same time. They fall into line and it's like Dave and Eddie are just walking and then they just they, they don't even like greet each other or anything. It's just like boom and then they just they go towards the stairs. And so we all watched it and I was up close and personal and it was just unreal awesome. Was that your favorite concert you've ever been to? It's up there, but um, no, I think my favorite time I saw Van Halen was the was still the first time in 2007. Because I, by that point, you, you had no idea if this tour was going to happen. If it was just going to be one show, then they'd all get in a huge fight. And they made it Again. to LA, and we got there early, and we tailgated, and had more than a couple beers, and got in there, and it was just like it, it was just the thing I've been waiting to see my entire life. So that was the first one is still the sweetest, but I've seen it a bunch of times since then. And it's always unreal. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I, I love that. I asked if that was your favorite concert and then you're like, no, but I'm going to keep talking about Van Halen because, <laughs> Aerosmith, because Van Halen. Aerosmith in 93 was pretty sweet. Oh, I wish I had seen them back then. I ended up catching Aerosmith with, who was at Kid Rock opening for him I in like 
2003. That's a good so show. In, in 2003, that's a great show. It was okay. <laughs> we got there right. We got there right as kid. Like, because we went to the, the amphitheater that I grew up in. Like, you can hear the concert from the freeway. Like, as soon as you get off the freeway and get into that massive line of cars to, like, go and park, yeah. you just roll your windows down because everybody's cars are just idling and nobody's, like, making that much noise. And you can hear the concert reverberating throughout the valley. So, like, we listened to Kid Rock set. And by the time we like parked and got to our seats, Kid Rock was like finishing Ba with the Ba. And I was like, oh, thank God. I don't want to listen to that song again. So <laughs> it was like as it was being played over and over on the radio. I will give you a dollar right here, right now, if you can tell me the band that opened for Aerosmith when I saw them in 93. So they're kind of, I guess, known as a one hit wonder, but it was a great album that they had. Mm. And the lead singer, she went on to write a bunch of huge hits and you'd have no idea that it was her writing it, but she wrote a shit ton of great music after that. And they weren't big? <clears throat> they were a big band because of one song. It's not heart. It's no, 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 no. Yeah. It, was, it was after heart. Um, the it, the song was called "What's Going On." Oh, oh and, no! And I oh, say, no. "Hey, yeah, yeah." Four non blondes. There you go. Yeah. And they were Rachel. They literally they get on stage, and I I counted. They played four songs, said thank you, good night, and got the hell out of there. And then Aerosmith comes up and rocks us for two and a half hours. Awesome. Oh my god, that's amazing! Yeah, yeah. We when we got there, uh, it was like I said, it was right as Chris Rock was ending, and it was at an amphitheater, and we were sitting in the grass. So there's like this, uh, there's a separation between the seats and a level change between the seats and the grass. And there was a stage set up with the back of the stage to the back of the the edge of the grass area so the stage went out onto the the ga area so all my friends are like well what's like what why do they have a stage i was like oh it's probably some opening band or whatever all of a sudden like halfway through aerosmith set the lights in the entire amphitheater cut out for three minutes come back on and aerosmith is like 20 yards away from me i have never run so fast <laughs> in my entire life like I was strong arming like old people and children. I did not care. I felt bad to, afterwards, but not really. That's your that's your chance to see a legendary band. So you do whatever it, it, you 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 run, and then you worry about the collateral damage later. Yeah. No. I mean, if they're not smart enough to get out of the way when they realize that Steven Tyler is right there, like no, that's your own <laughs> fault. Um, <laughs> so. I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having flashbacks now. So did you say what your favorite concert was then? If I had to pick one, I, I'll do a non-Van Halen one, and I'll say it was either Aerosmith then, or I saw Robert Plant and Jimmy Page when they were touring together, not as Led Zeppelin, but they were doing a Page and Plant tour. I saw them in Virginia Beach at the amphitheater there. It was great. It, they just came on stage and his blasted Zeppelin tunes, great drummer, great bass player, whoever they were, and it was awesome. And I think that was the show that Paul Rogers from Bad Company opened. And so he was in Free, and he was in Bad Company, and he did solo stuff after that, and he was great, and he performed for a while. And then the guys from Zeppelin come on stage, and it's just like it's you're watching rock and roll history. Yeah. I mean, there's there's so many iconic moments of of rock history that when you get to be a part of them, it's like the most amazing experience ever. I'm yeah. still yeah, kind of it, for that. yeah. You get to see it, and you get to see it when they were a machine, and that's why the Aerosmith one is special because that that was still Aerosmith, like at the peak of their power. They, they were they were touring on the Get a Grip album, and they were all like sober and just like ready to kick some ass so because sometimes you go see a band and it's like it's cool to see them but like there's probably a lot of guns and roses shows like that where hey the band showed up we didn't know where axel was for three hours and it, like i want to see a band when they're all ready to get on stage and kick some ass like i saw nirvana about three months before uh kurt died and i, I just remember leaving the show and just being like what the hell was that it was just it, it you could tell that it was just off and it's just there wasn't a, a good positive vibe there wasn't a lot of energy dave grohl had an amazing drum solo that was like 20 minutes and i just remember thinking like <laughs> what's going on with with kurt and chris because dave is just carrying this team on his back right now 
And it was, you know, it was just kind of a blah show. Yeah, I, I think uh, Nirvana gets a bad rap for like all of the stuff that happened at the very end of it. But it was such an amazing band, I think, for the pure fact that like Nirvana at its peak was Chris and, uh, oh my God, why did his name just fly out of my head? Who's the lead singer of Nirvana? Uh, Kurt. Kurt, thank you. I was like, Chris. I was like, it's not Chris. That's the other guy. Hey, um, kids, that Coors Light is dangerous, okay? Yeah, this is also after 17 years of touring, so don't do that. I do not recommend it. Um, the fact that I can still participate in the Schmodown is like amazing, like ridiculousness um, that I still have memory cells. Um, yeah. But I think that Nirvana was like Chris and Kirk at like the peak of their of their talent and what they were gonna do. And it was just the beginning of Dave Grohl. Like yeah. he's one of my favorite human beings on the face of the planet. He's so kind and so caring and just so disgustingly talented. Like and it's ridiculous. So necessary in that band because, you know, as great as, as Kurt and Chris were, they never really fancy themselves or, or had the desire to be great live stage performers. They just wanted to, to, to write and perform music and yeah. get it out to the world, but not to, like, like, I think he might even reference it in his note is like he, Kurt, like, was kind of apologizing towards the end that he's not Freddie Mercury. He's not like this larger than life front man. And, yeah. you know, I think that that kind of tortured him towards the end. So it's kind of shitty me to give them criticism. But it was just like, even for what that show was, and I saw a lot of grunge bands back in the day, because my, my older sister would take me to everything. Like We saw uh, Soul Asylum and wow. Spin Doctors and Screaming Trees and uh, Meat Puppets, Stone Temple I have, not heard the, I have not heard that name in decades. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. So got to see a lot of stuff and be thoroughly entertained by all of it. And my first concert was um, Toad the Wet Sprocket was the headliners. And the opening act was Dave Matthews Band. And nobody had ever heard of Dave. Dave is from my area. And so they were opening for Toad the Wet Sprocket. And like, we left that show and we went to the one bar in Williamsburg that I was allowed at because I was in like sixth grade. And we go to Paul's <laughs> Deli afterwards and we're all talking about that opening band and they had a fiddle player and it was awesome. And it's like, Toad was cool, but who the hell were those guys opening? They were they were, they were were great and you could see where they were heading. I cannot imagine Dave Matthews Band as an opening band because I've only seen them as a headliner and each song is like 55 minutes. Yeah. So like knowing an opening band set is like 20. I'm like, so what they played like a verse. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, oh God, I can't believe you got to see the tour that was based on uh, Aerosmith's Get a Grip. That was mm -hmm. funny enough. The very first album I ever owned, uh, my parents, bless them. I love you, mom. She's listening. Um, my parents got my older sister Alicia and I cassettes for Christmas one year and we unwrapped it together. And I looked, we each looked at ours. We looked at the other person's and without even looking, we just swapped because I had been given a uh, Mariah Carey music box and she had been given Aerosmith get a grip and we just traded. <laughs> and I was like, that that's our brand. Like that, that is very, very telling of who we were as people. And then somehow she ended up getting like a, uh, Green Day Dookie cassette, cassette guys, yes, cassettes, not CDs. Oh yeah, cassettes. Uh, and I ended up with that one too. I think I still have it somewhere around here. Remember, but, uh, uh, remember singles? That used to be the big thing in Williamsburg. Is you you would just go and get like a cassette single. So it wasn't like a the jewel box. It was just like a like a cardboard sleeve. So mm -hmm. like like I'm not I'm not gonna buy Sir Mix a Lot's album. Okay, I'm gonna go buy the Baby Got Back and the B side was Cake Boy, which was a fine tune. And I would go get <laughs> stuff like that. So I had a lot of cool singles. In addition to our, our, we had two record stores in Williamsburg. We had Bandbox, which was like the more hippie kind of one right in the college area near William and Mary. And then we had Echoes, which was a little more corporate, but you could go to both and just spend hours just looking at, at just flipping through CDs and flipping through cassettes. And like the Aerosmith Get a Grip one was good. I almost had that taken away from me in seventh grade. Oh uh, so I went to Catholic school and the nuns freaked out because my CD, they found like, you weren't even supposed to bring CDs back. You couldn't bring CDs to school. And I brought Aerosmith, I brought Pump and I brought Get a Grip. And the cover of Pump 
is a car being towed, but the way it looks like it is that the cars are having sex with one another. And Ooh. so that got taken away from me, but luckily I was able to hide the other Aerosmith album whose cover is a cow's utter pierced, like a nipple piercing. So I think that I came out okay. Yeah. There's a lot of things that happened in my childhood that I'm like, my parents should have known that this is how I was going to turn out. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, mom, for doing that. <laughs> I well, know. who's your favorite, like, who's your favorite band? Like, do you have an easy, like, accessible top three or top five off the top of your head? Band or albums? Um, ooh, that's good. Let's do albums instead. That's more fun. Ooh. Um, Left of South Centered by Butch Walker. Um, it is incredibly fantastic. Um, I mean, literally anything. This, this is the reason why I had to do artists instead of albums, because I'm like, oh, but wait but which album from this artist do I love? Or I could just do 10 of their albums. Um, but Left of Self-Centered by Butch. Um, ooh, pretty much anything by Kansas. Um, really? Probably, probably Overture, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, you know, I, I'm, I, I enjoy Kansas for the musicianship and there's some good tunes. Um, I, I, can't, I can't get through Dust in the Wind. I, I can't do it. It is, it is too melancholy for me what what about in uh old school when <laughs> if will ferrell's singing it <laughs> then i can get through it as long as it ends with you're my boy blue yeah. although yeah. to be fair at this point in time i don't think anybody who was born between like uh, born up to like the mid 90s can ever finish dust in the wind without saying those words uh, <laughs> you're my boy blue like like, I would really like to know if they just don't play that live anymore because the entire crowd just shouts that. If you're Kansas, you got to have fun with that. I mean, that's a song that you know you have to play live. You know the fans want it, and the fans are going to have some fun with it. So you know what you do? Play Dust in the Wind, and not even to 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 drown out the You're My Boy Blue, but just to pick the audience back up, go right from Dust in the Wind into uh, Point of No Return. Ooh. Yeah, that would be really, really good. Pick us up. Yeah. Yeah, I know that because uh, they had, uh, Carry On My Wayward Son has been used, basically it's it's now a Pavlovian response with uh, fans of the TV show Supernatural because they play it before the last episode of every season when something terrible always happens to the point where you're like, you're inconsolable for three days and you're just crying in bed with your sheets drawn, like shades drawn, like you just can't function anymore. So like, I know that they have had an issue with people just like breaking down in hysterical sobs at their concerts whenever they play that song. It's right. a great song, I love it. Um, but uh, in the third album, Shoot, sorry, <laughs> cheating. I'm looking at my collection. Um, <laughs> ooh, brand new, sick transit, Gloria. Have wow. to go with that one. Uh, they, I know it's a uh, so brand new and taking back Sunday had this whole like emo age back and forth, like hating each other. Uh, one guy stole the other girl's girlfriend and like was a big dick and. There's a whole thing, but six like that whole album is just so good. <laughs> it just yeah. makes you so excited. It was also it also came out during a time when they were still doing amazing movie music videos. Um, and there was this like through line storyline with all of the uh, music videos from that album, uh, which was really fun to like anticipate the next one because everything would end with like a picture of like a like a spray painted picture of like a sheep. And that was how it ended. And you're like, what the fuck does this sheet mean? <laughs> and so you just had to like wait because the like YouTube wasn't available at that point. It was like just coming up. So you couldn't like research anything. You couldn't find any hidden notes because they just weren't released yet. Yeah, right, right. It's it, it's weird how like if you go back as far back as like the 60s, the way that we consume music to today, like there's some things that are that have remained, that have remained consistent in such a long period of time. Like, like for instance, me driving around today in 2020 and I hear a song on the radio that I never heard before. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. I'll crank it up and I'll try to figure out who the artist is. My dad was doing the same shit back in the early 60s. It's like, it's it, it's kind of cool that, that there's that connection between music fans that the way that you discover music, certainly we have more ways to discover music, but there's some old fashion in the way that we discover it occasionally. Yeah. What was it? What was your favorite band that you've ever like discovered at a show? Or I mean, Dave Matthews aside. Um. Yeah, Dave. Dave is way up there. Um. 
Uh, band that I'd never heard of, and then saw them at a show. Um, in a weird way, it would actually be Foo Fighters because <laughs> I wasn't familiar with like a lot of their songs. I maybe heard one, and this was pretty soon after I moved to LA. I was at a buddy of mine's show because I had a buddy who was in a band, and he was playing this uh, this old joint in Hollywood called King King. And oh. I was at the bar, and Dave Grohl was right next to me. And I didn't, I, and like my only thing, and I'm much better at it now than I probably was back then, is like, don't freak out and like say the thing that they're known for and like ask them about it. So I was just like, whatever you do, don't say Nirvana. I don't care if you're talking about the band or the Buddhist principle, whatever, do not <laughs> mention Nirvana at all. And so I just asked him what he's up to, and we somehow got talking about, it, and he just kept saying my new band. And I was like, what's the name of your new band? And he's like, well, we've been around for a little bit. And then he said Foo Fighters. I'm like, oh, yeah, Foo Fighters. Then I just made that connection. Like, I should probably listen to Foo Fighters because this guy is cool. And I saw him with Nirvana. And I like him. And I should listen to Foo Fighters. And obviously, they're like one of the biggest rock acts of the last, what, 20 years. Maybe 30, years. almost. Yeah. <laughs> like, because he used, I know that he used songs that he wrote while he was still, oops, while he was still with Nirvana for Foo Fighters. Yeah. Um, and like, that's just amazing to me. He is like the nicest man. I love that uh, he used to, uh, when they were recording albums, cause he lives in Encino. So it's like a hop, skip and a jump away. Uh, but when I first moved to LA, I lived in Tarzana and there was a bar about a block and a half North of us called Paladino's. Um, and if you've watched uh, uh, Community, they use that bar in that, in that scene as well, or in that show, uh, it's used a lot. But uh, I went over one night to go see a friend of mine who was a bartender, and I guess while they while Foo Fighters records, he likes to hear the songs in a venue, and he was there at like midnight on a Wednesday or Tuesday or something, singing songs from Skin and Bone <laughs> That's so that had not been released yet that he was in the middle of recording, but he also grows his hair out while they record, so he just looked like this crazy bum sitting on the stage with the guitar, just like singing to himself. And I was like, that voice sounds so familiar. He just wandered into the room because like the, the bar area and like the stage area were completely separate. And I wandered in and sat down at the table right in front of him and he looked up and I was like, oh my God, it's Dave Grohl. Oh my God, like I'm internally freaking out. I'm like, I'm gonna be right back. Went and got him a Budweiser, brought it to him. And I was like, I love you. <laughs> and on that note, best part about Dave Grohl, Coors Light drinker. Which I found out after bringing him a Bud Light. But <laughs> <laughs> he was like, thanks. And I'm like, I'm sorry, if it's not your brand, I'll get you another one. He's like, no, it's fine. I was like, okay. But then he sat down and like chatted with me for like an hour and I like floated back to my apartment. He's great, man. I, I was for a second. So I'm going to do my top five uh, debut albums, my top yes, five fan debut albums. So I was I wanted to, to throw Nirvana in there, but they had one come out before Bleach. I don't know if it really counts as a debut, so I'm gonna gonna strike Nirvana from the record. And in their place at number five, I'm gonna put another grungy kind of band. I'm gonna put Stone Temple Pilots Core at number five because that's an awesome, awesome announcement kind of record. At number four, I'm gonna say pronounced Leonard Skinner, which is Leonard Skinner's first album which kicks ass and it's just the best southern rock you could ever want to hear at number three is boston ladies and gentlemen boston their debut out it's one of the greatest albums ever recorded in my opinion it's just so good so full of great pop rock songs number two you know what? i might have to put led zeppelin sorry stone temple Pies. i'm putting led zeppelin one at number five instead <laughs> so I'm, bumping, I'm bumping sdp out they had their moment and now get the hell out for zeppelin so number two is Appetite for Destruction. When that thing dropped in 87, it dropped amongst a sea of similar sounding kind of stuff, but yet Guns N' Roses sounded different than all the other kind of more hair pop metal stuff that was going on. There was something different about it, and the cream rose at the top, and the entire album kicks ass. Number one, in 1978, you had disco ruling, you had a lot of R&B, you had a lot of singer-songwriter, you had a lot of overproduced rock songs, and you had punk rock, and then Van Halen's like, we're just going to take the best part of each one of these, and then we have the flamboyance of our lead singer, we have the greatest guitar player that ever lived, here it comes, boom, the eruption that was Van Halen 1. It's a really good list. It's so good. I, 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 I wish you had Meet the Beatles on there. So. 
I mean, they're great and I love them. Uh, no, when you mentioned Boston, my mom is uh, watching backstage. And as soon as you said Boston, I saw her head do this. What? <laughs> <laughs> Because I was brought up on all that stuff. Like we oh, weren't yeah. allowed to touch the radio dial until we were like eleven. <laughs> yeah. And so I was raised on like doo-wop and you know everything from the six from like the fifties to like the late seventies. So all of that stuff I am very well versed in. And my friends are always like, "Why do you know this Mamas and the Papas song?" And I was like, "Because I still have their cassette." Oh. Because. We would listen to that on drives down to LA and I know every single word of Gary Gatlin's uh, All the Golden California, still to this you would, day. You, you would lose your mind. At the uh, the gym that I go to um, when I'm allowed to go to gyms and hopefully I can get back there soon because I need it, um, is uh, they have they play like this sped up kind of remixed version of some classic songs and I can't I can't help but laugh when uh, California Dreamin' comes on as like a fast, upbeat, like workout. So it's like that. And uh, and With or Without You by U2 is another one that they, like they, they sped up Crazy Train too in a cool way. And that makes sense. But like With okay. or Without You, it's like, who just, who just got dumped? And is it the gym? I, I guess that's a lot of people actually. I guess that's most people at the gym. Everyone. They, they just got dumped and they're thinking about their ex and they're really pissed about it. Yeah, we, uh... Uh, so I toured with Warp Tour for a bunch of summers and they're, they started doing these uh, Pop Goes Punk albums. And so like, I know that there was like a few summers, I think it was like 2009 or 2008, 2009, where everyone was doing at least one cover for every set that they did on the Warp Tour. And it was like, I can't remember how many times I heard Kelly Clarkson being sung by a death metal band. Like, it was fun the first time, but after like the 70th day of tour, you're like, I'm going to take that guitar and make you not play that because I can't stand it anymore. My, it uh, so my, so my buddy who, who was in the band that was playing at King King that night, they, they were like a very, very like hard rock metal -y kind of act. And they did a cover in the middle just to like mess with people. They did a cover of Billy Joel's Uptown Girl and it kicked ass it was so awesome that is one of my favorite songs my mom and i used to sing that on the way back over the hill from santa cruz whenever we go to santa cruz uh, and drive back to san jose and i would always take the high part and i you can hear my voice <laughs> it's not high i can't hit those notes but when you're driving on 17 and rolling over the hill like you roll down the windows, you blast Billy Joel, and you do your damnedest to hit those notes. That's the key, man. If, if you're driving at a nice rate of speed and the windows are down, everybody can hit the notes like Mike Love and Brian Wilson. We all sound like Beach Boys when we're Absolutely. driving at a certain speed. Well, yeah. I mean, that's that's actually one of the things that I miss that I, I want to start doing again and start doing like little drives because you can still be in your car by yourself with your windows down, driving around, having a good time. Like, I needed like it. I'm actually gonna go in like a week because I need to get my rent check and I need to get a cashier's check to pay my rent at the building I live in. So there's like, there's a bunch of uh, banks I could go to. There's like a bunch of Wells Fargo's that are like right around the corner, but the line is always like around the corner. So I'll drive up to like Thousand Oaks <laughs> and just blast music. Same thing that I usually do if I have to go to the DMV is I'm not going to the DMV in LA. You kidding oh, me? God, no. Drive up 30, 30 miles. It may be take, especially like with what's going on right now, you can get there in 30 minutes tops mm -hmm. and it's a beautiful drive. You roll the windows down. You have a nice iced tea with you. You sing your ass off and you get your check and you come back and you, and you've had a day and you've done something with your day. Yeah, I thought you were going to say there's this really like your favorite bank is down in San Diego, because at this point, like, why the fuck not? San Diego wouldn't be bad. Now, look, I, I, I've been known to drive upwards of an hour for a great burrito. So I, I will do that, too. And, and the oh. burrito is infinitely more rewarding than losing your money to your landlord. <laughs> but you got to do what you got to do. We were, I was out on tour with, I want to say it was in American in Paris, like three years ago, and we had a lunch stop in uh, Syracuse, New York. Uh, and I had planned ahead because one of my favorite restaurants is in Syracuse, but our stop was like 15 miles away from the restaurant. Yeah. So I was like, okay, we're about 35 minutes out. I'm gonna call them, place my order for like 
$75 worth of food because I love this place. <laughs> we literally pulled in, we parked. I had an Uber waiting for me. I hopped in the Uber. He took me to the place. I went in, got my food that was prepaid, got back in the Uber and went back literally four minutes before they called bus call to go back on the bus. <laughs> And people were like, where are you going? I'm like, I'm going to go get the best food in Syracuse. You enjoy your your uh, your Sabaros in the mall. Uh, Kyle Kanane used to have a great joke where he said, like, you know that you have a drinking problem when it's 2 p.m. and you ask your taxi driver to take you to the Wendy's drive-thru. <laughs> and, but... But now with the advent of like Uber and Lyft and everything, when we were doing the, the Schmodown in Houston, it was me, Oof. Riley, and Julie, his lovely bride-to-be, and we were on an Uber, and I just sweet-talked the Uber into taking us to Whataburger. And so we waited for like 20 minutes in, in line, but you make pleasant conversation, and you get to know someone, and you get Whataburger, which I enjoyed. They hated, but I thought it was great. Oh, I mean, I don't eat Whataburger anymore, but even I remember Whataburger fondly. Like, Yeah. How it's do you, good stuff. Yeah, it's good. I mean, it's not. I know this is, I'm going to get a lot of hate. It's not in and out, but uh, I've also been meat free for like almost a decade. So my memory is a little skewed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> where have you? Uh, where? where uh, actually, that reminds me. So uh, tonight we have uh, our drinking buddy uh, for my Patreon is Jeremiah Morris. Uh, and he, I saw a big shout out to you. Thank you so much for being a patron. Uh, he wants to know what is your favorite crowd to perform to? Ooh, uh, Jeremiah Moore's great, great beard. Keep it up. Yes. Guy. Um, my favorite kind of crowd to perform to. Um, I like a mix. I like a mix of everything. I like a, I like a wide swath, the diverse backgrounds, couples, I like some drunks, not too many drunks. I like a few people that are going to woo, a lot of people that are going to clap, a ton of people that are going to laugh, and no one that's going to talk. That's my ideal crowd right there. Yeah, not the guys in the front row in Chicago. Uh <laughs> you, we had to we had to teach them a lesson. Those fucking lamies. I don't think they were. <laughs> no, no, they didn't care. They were like, whatever, we're out. <laughs> um, Michael K has sent in a five dollar stream lab. Thank you so much. He wants to know, Mark, your test with creating the ultimate supergroup. Who would you add to the lineup? Okay, so um, let's see how many how many slots do I get? Do I get five band members? You can you can rush it, or you can Dave Matthews band it. Doesn't matter. I it, I, I'd be leaving out too many. I think it'd be cheating to Dave Matthews or like Skinner it and just put like thirty people on on stage. Yeah, this um, isn't Grand Funk Railroad. So yeah, yeah right, right. <laughs> we're, we're not, we're not Chicago. We're not bringing a full orchestra to the table. Um, uh, I think we all know who my guitar player is. That's Eddie Van Halen. Um, my drummer is going to be. It's close between Keith Moon, Ginger Baker, but I would probably take John Bonham. Would be my drummer. Um, my bass player. Might be Getty Lee because Getty can not only play bass, but he can like hit some really high notes if I need him to, um, to be a lead singer. My lead singer, speaking of, is going to be, oh boy, I'll take Steven Tyler as my lead singer. Interesting. I like, I like a little bit of a rasp. Freddie Mercury, I think, is the greatest front man that ever lived, but I like a little bit of a rasp and a little bit of like, I've done a lot of <laughs> dirty, nasty drugs and drinking excursions in my day. That's what I want. That's what I get with Steven Tyler. So that's a pretty sweet band I just put together. And then yeah. if I'm going to have a rhythm guitarist, I'd probably put somebody who can go lead, but they can also just hold down a rhythm line. So I might say um, Malcolm Young from ACDC would be my rhythm Ooh, guitar. Good call. Yeah. You went and, very... And they're going to have some parties after the show. You went very thematic with yours. I think mine would be all over the place. I think I'd put Tommy at drums. Yeah. I would... <sighs> Bass-wise. I don't know. I don't know who I'd put in bass. Like, there's like thousands of guys that I could throw into bass because it's it's bass and there's so many... Like It just depends on the sound you want. <sighs> I think that I would put John Mayer as lead guitar because that man can... Effing play. Mm -hmm. 
Um, he hangs out around the comedy store a lot. Yes. Well, what else does he have to do? Um, <laughs> it's not recording. Give me more albums, John. His last one was really good, by the way. Um, he's, a player. he's he's great when he jams with Grateful Dead and they do the Dead and Company shows. He's, oh, he's awesome. So good. Actually, I went and saw him live and uh, a buddy of mine got me uh, the entire show on CD. Uh, and he literally in the middle of the show stops to tie one shoe and then like five, like two songs later, like stops to tie the other shoe because it wasn't the same tightness and it was distracting him. And he goes, if anybody's bootlegging this, can you make those two separate tracks? And my friend did. And I was like, this is my favorite. Like my friends understand me and get me. And I love that. It's just great to be in front of that many people and just have that kind of wink and nod self-awareness, you know, not, yeah. not being a diva about it, but just like, hey, I'm just a person and I got to tie my goddamn shoe. Yeah. And, and knowing that people are bootlegging your show. It's, yeah. it's fine. Yeah, right. Like he's like, oh, I made $13 million today. It's okay. You can sell those CDs for five bucks. <laughs> it's not going to hurt my bottom line. <laughs> yeah, Pearl Jam w was one of the first ones. I guess Grateful Dead didn't really care, but I don't know the Grateful Dead really knew how much they were being bootlegged. Pearl <laughs> Jam was yeah. always really cool about it, which is like they 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 went to war with Ticketmaster practically, and then they were just like, you know what? Maybe that was part of it. I don't remember how the whole thing went down. I just know that Pearl Jam bootlegs are very easy and accessible, and the band actually encourages it. So that's yeah, that, that's pretty cool. I remember they went to Ticketmaster over the charges because the charges yeah. at one point ended up being almost as much per ticket as the actual ticket. And they were like, no, we're not going to do that. We're just going to avoid uh, every Ticketmaster run or affiliated venue. And they were left with like three places to play in the U S. Um, <laughs> did you see uh, when Letterman inducted them into the hall of fame? I think I did, but it's been a very long time. So when, when they went into the rock and roll hall of fame, like 2016, 2017, um, they were scheduled to have Neil Young, but Neil Young couldn't make it to induct them. And so like pretty much the morning of, uh, Eddie Vedder called Dave Letterman and is like, hey, if you're in town, can you come induct us into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? If you happen to be in Cleveland. Yeah, so <laughs> Letterman shows up. Well, the, the ceremony was in LA, which is smart. Um, oh. So they, uh, so Letterman, and this is like Letterman post-show, and so he's got like his full beard and everything, and he had this great line. He's like, you know, Pearl Jam went to bat for everyone against Ticketmaster. And because of their efforts, I'm proud to say now every concert is free. <laughs> it's just, oh, wow. it, it, Letterman is just such a gem. Oh, he's the best. He's so good. And so uh, Haskell brings up uh, the lead singer from Disturbed. Always forget his name. He's really good. Field. He gets really That's deep. Martin. Yeah. Um, so uh, do you remember Cracked? Yes. The, the website cracked. So they did this skit of four of their guys sitting around uh, playing poker or something. And one of their mom calls and he's like, yeah, I'm sitting, you know, I'm sitting here with, you know, these guys and names them. And she, he goes, what? Band practice? What are you talking about? And like all of them had forgotten that they were in the band Disturbed. <laughs> and they were, she was, he was like yelling at his mom. He's like, why didn't you tell me? She's like, I thought you knew. Like, <laughs> it's one of my favorite sketch sketches of all time. Like I will go back and rewatch that over and over. Cause it's just like, even the guys in disturbed were like, that's really funny. That's great. I remember when cracked was a magazine. Wow. It was, Paper a, and all that. it was a competitor of mad magazine and it was nowhere near as good. Was that like, nationwide? Um, mad. What mad magazine was the well, goal. Mad yeah. was for magazines and then cracked was like the same kind of stuff. Like they'd have like a movie would come out then they'd parody it, but it was just never, this could not, could not top the original. Yeah. No, I mean, very few things can, but Agreed. It's just, I mean, a for effort. I mean, we got a great website out of it and we got cracked yeah. after hours, which was mm -hmm. something that I used to watch at the airports during travel days uh, repeatedly. Yep. Uh, what is your favorite airport to fly into and out of? Because you travel super heavily, or you used to. Um. <laughs> used to. Um, <laughs> my favorite airport, I, I find DFW very convenient to get around in. Um, I like that light rail system they have. 
I just I, I hate seeing the Cowboys themed bar. It, I, like I can't stand. It. I had a beer there one time and it just it tasted so bad I couldn't do it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, DFW is really good, and the Phoenix one has gotten really good too because they have like you can go crush a burger or a pizza, but they also have some like health food kind of places there too and they have a starbucks which like i can't go i can't even have a like if i if i land and i'm like late for my connection i'm still going to starbucks first i need the iced tea i need an iced tea before i go on every flight Interesting. Just, I, I, and then i still try to sleep on the flight so my whole <laughs> world kids is just one big weird dichotomy of forces now, are you, are you a plane sleeper? Because I know a lot of people can't fall asleep when they get on a plane. I can do it sometimes. I'm not great at it, but I can do it sometimes. I also got this app on my phone called Desert Golf, and it just basically you just play golf forever. And all you do is you just take your phone, you just drag your finger, and then the, that shoots the ball, and you just try to get in the hole as quick. And I have like – here, I'll show you – what my scorecard looks like because it doesn't it doesn't keep track so i have to keep track of like every 18 holes uh or 72 holes so this is like these are all my scores in desert golf oh going all the way <laughs> back so i is that in your notes yeah i like to compete rachel and when there's nobody to compete against i compete against myself wow yeah there's That's a nice in my head and everything I, I get on that plane as soon as as soon as I know that nobody is sitting next to me and I'm not going to have to move. I buckle my seatbelt. I make a joke to the flight attendant because I'm going to end up waking up at some point. I sit back, I put my headphones in, and I am out like a light. People get so mad at me for how fast I fall asleep on planes, but then like once you get to the you know once you get up there, depending on how long the flight is, you know you wake up, you make another joke to the flight attendant, and then they bring you a free drink, and it's all amazing. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's very impressive. I am in awe and envious of people who can fall asleep on planes that easy. So I'm not a big plane drinker either, though. Like, I, I, okay. eh, 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 eh. Well, I mean, it depends on what you have to do once the plane lands. Like, if I am doing a one flight to where I have to pick up a rental car, I'm obviously not going to drink because right. that is the worst idea ever. Because you can't you can't sashay up to the Enterprise and be like. Hey, how you doing? Oh, <laughs> God. Like my car, you gave me a free drink. Yeah. <laughs> the flight attendants on Southwest are amazing. Just, um, no, every time if you meet me in an airport, you know you can you can set your watch by it. You know that I'm just thinking about my nap that I'm going to take once I get to the hotel. That's that's the goal of traveling is that hotel nap. It's just it's at least three hours and it's <laughs> it's perfect. A three hour nap. Interesting. Perfect. Yeah, I uh, we used to we used to have so many because we our flights used to get booked uh by the corporation and like you know the the we had a company that would book our flights and you know gets the cheapest possible one so there was always layovers. Uh, we landed in Charlotte so many times one year that we became friends with a bartender to where we would text him when we landed, and by the time we got like we would tell him what gate we were at. By the time we got to his bar, our seats were cleared with new drinks for us ready to go that is that is first class service that is your sky miles at work yeah we uh we we met him at the end of a relationship saw him through his next girlfriend who he ended up marrying and now has his second child on the way because i just got a text from him like two weeks ago because wow. uh, we still talk and this is like nine years later like this it's is a bartender the relationship out of, and you board. develop with the bartenders. Is, it's some of the most meaningful relationships of a life are the ones because they're the ones that are there for you with what you need, when you need it. And they listen to you. It's so wonderful. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, it is getting to the close. I feel like I am just hogging all of Mark's time. So if you have any questions, uh, super chat them or not super chat them because I don't have the hours or the followers for that. Uh, send them on the stream labs real quick. We're going to talk for about another five minutes. If anybody has any more questions, we'll ask them and then we'll close up. Um, has there be ever been a band that you wanted to see, but you haven't had the chance to? Oh, yeah. I, I got close. Um, Christian and I got tickets uh, through the radio station to go see ACDC at Dodger Stadium, but we couldn't go that night. And I had like a set or something, and he had just, you know, uh, started. I, I think that his oldest 
kid had already been born and she was probably a newborn at the time. So he couldn't go and I couldn't go see ACDC at Dodger Stadium. That turned out to be the last tour with uh, Malcolm Young and with Brian Johnson to this point. But there's rumors that Brian Johnson, there's this new miracle surgery that he can have where he can actually sing and not lose all his hearing. But um, yeah, I missed them at Dodger Stadium. So that's that's a pretty big bummer because I, I missed Guns N' Roses at Dodger Stadium too because I was on the road. But, you know, I, I it, going to a Guns N' Roses show is such a crapshoot because you just don't know what you're getting from Axel at this point. You know what you are going to get every night from ACDC. And so a band that comes to play and comes to play hard every night, that's the kind of band that you want to rely on. And I missed my chance to, to see them. So that's a bummer. Hopefully – Brian can tour one more time, and I will definitely not miss that show. Yeah, Brian and Chris from ACDC ended up, for some reason, at this charity show that I was working at the Viper, and I was, you know, uh, helping get people from upstairs to come downstairs to do their interviews for, you know, press and everything, and then, like, lead them back upstairs, and, like, they were just standing there, like, hanging out, and I was like... (laughs) That is... You're not so on our cool. schedule, but would you guys like an interview? <laughs> like, can we interview you? They're like, sure. And like handed me their drinks. And I'm like, what is my life? <laughs> That's awesome. One, one time, uh, a buddy of mine were at the Whiskey, a go-go, uh, seeing a Van Halen cover band called the Atomic Punks. They're great. And we look over at the bar and post up at the bar is Lemmy from Motorhead. And he just looked like, he, he looked like the ghost of a pirate from like the 1800s and it was just he was just the most kick-ass human being i've ever seen in real life up close it was it was awesome you know this is just like feeding into why everybody loves my mom my mom actually met lemmy uh when i when i first moved down to la uh i was 20 so by the time i turned 21 in april uh she came down to visit and i had been talking about the bow which is the rainbow room for anybody who does not live in la and it is synonymous with drugs it's it's the place where you went for a drug sex and rock and roll like it mm-hmm. was it's it was the mecca in the 70s it still is to this day i hope to god it still opens up when all of this is over i don't think mario will let it close um but i've been talking about it so much that when my mom came down she's like let's go to the bow and i was like <laughs> okay we're gonna stay on the balcony like we're gonna stay outside on the patio and he and was I, like, playing photo hunt wasn't he <laughs> i have no idea this was almost 12 years ago um yeah, Lemmy was famous for he came out of that patio bar at the rainbow and he would play photo hunt like all day yeah so he was he was just hanging out and uh i got a table for my mom and i and i was like okay sit here like our drinks are coming over like my friend christine is the bartender i'm just gonna she'll bring over the drinks i'm gonna go to the bathroom i will be right back i come back and she's like chatting with lemmy like they're old friends i'm hey. like of course this is my mother See, because she's Lemmy's type of gal. She's real. She's authentic. She's funny. She's nice. She's personable. That's the kind of like, you know, that uh, her and Lemmy, I can see that happening. I can see that working. Mom, do you want to come on and just nod? Yeah. Do you want to come in? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so she, mom was hanging out backstage. And I started telling this story and she's like, what? <laughs> I know. I said, I don't remember that though. Let's be, he was he was the really old guy with like the he had like a long uh, long scraggly ha- dark hair and like a beard and I was like that's Lemmy and I came back and he like left because he was sitting in my seat and you were like he was very nice and I'm like that's yeah I, I remember one of the that. most prolific rock stars <laughs> ever and you're like okay and then yep. drank my drink I did not. You have a I think it was probably refreshing for Lemmy to talk to someone who didn't look like a mm-hmm. motorhead groupie, who just looked like a real, like, well-adjusted human being. So you were probably a breath of fresh air for this looked dead like. pirate rock star. True. <laughs> <laughs> look like, huh? It sounds about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my my mom's more hardcore than I am, guys. Don't let that uh, oh, yeah. don't let that mom fa- facade fool you. Uh, <laughs> Okay, mom, sorry, I just wanted you to come on. I know, take me off. Okay, I love you. <laughs> no, she she really enjoyed her night at the bow. It was very fun. It's yeah, funny. She she should, as everybody should. If when in LA, definitely at least do a drive by of the rainbow and the whiskey. Yeah. I am sad that the key club has closed and reopened as yeah. the oak. 
it was some like club. I don't know. It makes my heart sad. Before it was the key club, it was Gazzari's. And it was like, that was the rock club that broke so many bands in the seventies is like you, if you could get on a Gazzari's, then you had a chance of being seen by somebody in the know. So it was like Gazzari's and then rainbow and then whiskey just all right there in a row. So it was really back at the, the getting into the peak days of rock and roll on the sunset strip. It was amazing. Okay. We have one more stream lab from PC and she says, so that chick that was in the bathroom with that guy in Atlanta got his attention by doing the bend and snap. She was so horny. She was trying to hit on Lindsay Payne, LOL. Good times. Yep, that's the uh, that's the famous bathroom incident that Justin and I lived through because we heard somebody else came back to our table and is like, hey, there's people having sex in the, in the guy's bathroom. So Justin and I look at each other and we're like, yeah, well, we got to go see this. So <laughs> we go in there to, you know, go to the bathroom and sure enough, they're going at it, but they're also chatty. And then they're talking with us and we're just having like a cordial, oh. loud, drunken conversation about rock bands. And they were carrying on as they were Boss making getting loud. Loud. And we were just, we were accessories to the crime of passion that was taking place in that stall. Uh, amazing. Yeah. All right, guys, if nobody has any more questions, I'm going to close up with my favorite quote and question of all time. Uh, one of my favorite movies of all time is uh, Almost Famous. I used to watch it the night before I would leave for every tour. Um, and I love the way that it ends. Um, so to quote William Miller, do you have to be happy to write a love song? Do you have to be sad to write a depressed song? What is it you love about music? Ooh. What is it I love about music? Um, I love the kinetic energy that makes me feel like I'm part of something greater than myself. So even though I may be stationary, isolated, in a car, all alone, I feel like I am the one that is on stage that is belting out these tunes, the great community experience that is music and particularly my genre of rock and roll. It makes you feel like you are all one and the same. One love, one heart. You got one life, Rach. You got to do what you should. I think I've done enough for two lifetimes. Um... <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I'm going to kick you off real quick, bring you back after. Uh, we'll chat afterwards. Um, so thank you so much for coming on, Mark. You are the best. I absolutely adore you. Everybody no. say bye. This is the best. I'm just number yes. two. <laughs> All right, cheers, babe. I'll talk to you in a second. All right, guys, so a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we have had such a great time uh, this last – I've well, I've had such a great time this last uh, month and a half, almost two months now. Can you believe it? This is insane. Um, but I do have an announcement that next week, my guest is going to be the one and only John the Outlaw Roca. Uh, it's going to be 7 p.m. next Thursday, May 28th. So set those alarms, um, set the timers. It'll all be super fun. Um, and then after that, um, in addition to that, I have another thing to announce. Saturday I am going to be bleaching my hair because I have lost my ever loving mind. Um, we are doing it live. Alex Mack and uh, Kelsey uh, from Call to Action are going to be co-hosting this for me um, while I live broadcast me trying to bleach my hair. Um, we're gonna do some movie trivia. It's gonna be an AMA. Uh, you get to vote on what is the final color of my hair. So it's gonna be very interactive. Um, so come on by, hang out. It's I have no idea how long it's gonna be, but starting at 10 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Um, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for hanging out with me this last uh, seven, eight weeks, seven weeks. Who knows? M numbers don't matter. You know that. Thank you again. And I will see you next week for the Outlaw. Um, join my Patreon. Uh, you can, sorry, Patreon's over there. Um, sending your super chats, uh, questions for uh, John, and we will see you next week. Thank you so much. <laughs>